thank you for sharing. Thank, uh, thank you for uh, sharing some of my bio because what I'd really like to do is start the day by giving everybody my cell phone number. 917-297-3674. And you can reach me by email, CynthiaHealthQuest at yahoo.com. So for those of you that want to have a follow-up phone call or have a question, please feel free to reach out. I've always believed that that's one of the most important things of spending time with people that we want to meet or we want to learn more from is having access to them again not just a one of. So I wanted to spend my time today to tell you some of the lessons that I learned at an early age that have led this wonderful path of entrepreneurship for me. My first job at 16 years old, officially, I really wanted to work in a restaurant that was so popular. It had more than an hour waiting list for people to come in and have dinner, very lively spot. And there was a young man in my class that was working in the restaurant as a busboy. So I asked Albert, it, would it be possible, is that restaurant hiring more people? I'd love to be there and work. And he said, well, yes, they do want to hire people, but you can't be a hostess because you have to be 18 to be a hostess. And you're only 16, but you could get a job as a bus girl. So I went down to the restaurant to apply for this job as bus girl because I really wanted to work there. And this wonderful manager came out to interview me after I filled out the one page employment uh, information sheet and her name was Sue Terry. And she looked at me and she looked at the sheet and she said, do you wanna be a hostess or do you wanna be a bus girl? And I said, well, I really want to be a hostess, but Albert told me that you would only hire someone 16 to be a bus girl. And she said, no, Albert's wrong. And you should always apply for something that you want to be. Don't let somebody else tell you what you should do. Apply for the job that you want. And of course, I was elated and very excited and became a hostess. And then within two years, I was managing the restaurant. I was still going to high school, but they did make me a manager. So one of my first thoughts for entrepreneurs, for business leaders, for people that are in roles, go for what you want. Don't go for what someone else tells you you should settle for. I think that's really important. I told Jenny that also one of the things I wanted to talk today about was building your own brand. What makes you unique in the marketplace? And I was laughing when I was reading Montana Outdoor Magazine. There's a wonderful photographer and, and biologist named John Ashley. And I received Montana Outdoor Magazine because I do have a fishing license and hunting license for Montana. And one of the stories that John Ashley wrote about in this new issue is that he photographed the rarest of Montana mammal, a black-footed ferret. And it, a black-footed ferret is nocturnal. No one ever sees them, except if you're out at night. And one of the conclusions is that people do not protect a species they never see. And I think that it really applies to entrepreneurs. Don't be afraid to be seen as an entrepreneur. Build your brand. Don't just be a nocturnal animal that no one ever sees. Make the point to get to know other people. I know we've had challenges in doing things in person the last two years, but I still believe that that's one of the most valuable things to do is get out and be seen, interact with other people. And I think that uh, building your own brand, when you think about, well, how do I wanna be perceived? How do I wanna be seen? Sometimes it's easy to think about brands that you already know or use, like, uh, Sony or the Nike brand of just do it. You know, which brand do you associate yourself the most with? And how do you build on that reputation of your own brand equity? How do you have name recognition? 
And I think that it's really important to think about the things that are important to you and incorporate that into your brand, whether it's not just on a professional level, but also your hobbies, your likes, the places you've traveled. I think one of my great experience was having an opportunity to take a film crew to Uzbekistan and film uh, two weeks in Uzbekistan with Rudy Maxa and talk about the beauty of Uzbekistan. It's one of only two double landlocked countries. And that experience opened up a lot of opportunities. I was also on the board of the American Uzbek Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm an American. I did not have roots in Uzbekistan until I started with that opportunity. But it was wonderful and unique and a great experience to have a chance to be in such an amazing country, which had been really one of the breadbaskets of Europe. I would also say share your vision. Don't be afraid to tell people what you're working on, your ideas. Uh, it's very unusual for someone to come out and take the energy and time to copy you or your ideas. So share your vision with people. Um, inspire others. Talk to others about what you want to do and what you're trying to do and inspire them on what they're trying to achieve. I think that talking about ideas has tremendous merit and you will find that you have probably more things in common and can learn so much from the people that you share your ideas with. So I think those are things that are super important. Um, celebrate your wins. Um, don't be nonchalant about a great day. Be excited about it and have your team celebrate with you. I think those are key elements to success in in building your brand, that people know you're somebody that they can count on to celebrate with them and that when there's a win for the business and they can be incremental wins. They don't all have to be the pinnacle of a win. Even incremental wins are important and exciting, I think, for all of us. And I think the other thing is to look for great role models in your everyday life. And I'm very, very fortunate to have some wonderful role models in my life. And one of them is the chairman and CEO of Ethan Allen, Farouk Kathwari, who came to the United States from Kashmir. And if you wanna really learn about perseverance, endurance, ingenuity, quality, read, read Farouk's book, Trailblazer. Um, getting to know people that have done things that are exceptional in their life is inspirational to me. And I'm sure you feel the same way, that there's a lot of opportunity that we can generate in our own world from learning about how other people have been successful. And I think the other important thing in life is to try something new. Don't just do things the same way you've been doing them. Try something new, try a new recipe take a walk, drive home a different way. I think all of those things build our optimism, they build our mindfulness and they build our gratitude for the things that we get to do. And uh, I think that one of the other things that I really enjoy doing are reading biographies of people. And there's a, an interesting US postage stamp that's coming out right now of a woman named uh, Dr. Clark they, she's known as the shark woman, which I, I really like that too, but she is an expert in marine biology. And I think it's great that even a postage stamp is honoring a woman who has spent a lot of her adventure time learning about sharks. And maybe that's one of the things that as entrepreneurs, we all need to spend more time learning about are who are the sharks in life. So those are the things that I wanted to touch on and and share, um, and I wanted really a lot of the call today to be focused on ways to ask questions and help build your brand. I think it's, it's natural that we follow people that we like and people that we know, but I, I also think it's important to look at examples of success. And when you're building your company, it's good to have diversity of ideas. 
I think one of the interesting companies to look at in diversity on their board is the Apple Computer. And Apple has directors, they're not necessarily high tech people at all on the board. They have the founders of Genentech and the officers from Boeing and Johnson and Johnson, um, BlackRock. So they didn't just buy the story that they should have people that are high tech people. They have plenty of high tech people. Surround yourself with people that think a little differently. And I think it allows us to grow not only professionally, but a lot of times personally. So I'm gonna stop there and see if somebody has some questions and wants to, to share something of their experience too. I'll give some folks some, some time to kind of brainstorm some questions and take advantage of the, of the, the dead air to ask my own <laughs> question. So I, this is Farooq Athwari. I'm very, very happy to be on the call. I've known Cynthia for a long time and Cynthia, I appreciate your comments about uh, the book that I wrote. And we are really, really pleased this year, a few months back to have Cynthia join our board of directors. She is a tremendous background as an entrepreneur, as an, a person who has a uh, varied background from finance to healthcare to many, many areas. Really it is, uh, and most importantly, uh, your the way you conduct yourself with humility, I think that is tremendous. So thank you for your, for, for all that you do and also mentioning the, the book, so thanks. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, Cynthia, this is uh, Kay Van Norman from Bozeman. And thank you so much for, for making yourself available to us. It's just a, a, an honor. You've done so much, it's amazing. Um, the question I had um, is I've had a, a career in um, healthy aging, senior living, primarily you know, creating healthy aging programs, wellness programs. Um, trying to, to train people and creating cultures of well-being rather than illness management, but I'm, I'm transitioning to more of a consumer focus and finding myself pulled that direction. And I kind of at a, at a loss of how to, to make that shift. I'm very well known in the senior living, you know, healthy aging industry, but, but not in the consumer industry. Do you have any thoughts on kind of how to get started in that? Well, I congratulate you first on your effort and spending time on the healthy living and healthy aging process. I think that is something we're all interested in. And uh, from my perspective, I will laugh a little bit, Kay, when I tell you that in 1995, when I started HealthQuest and started producing events focused, that we're going to focus on consumers there were a lot of naysayers. They said, no, the consumer is not the market for health. It has to be professionals. Mm -hmm. And we all know that also 1995, there was a huge leap in opportunity to use the internet to search for information. And personal health information became one of the key elements for uh, consumers to find out all kinds of things about their health. Um, so my feeling is that one of the great ways to learn more about the consumer market for health and wellness and well being is to, I would also try to spend time with people that focus on consumer branding. And I think that a lot of it is not only on the internet, but a lot of it is in telemedicine. And uh, one of the people that does a lot in bringing that together is someone in Arizona who I'd be happy to introduce you to. Uh, Kent Dix, who has a company called 365 Health, okay. because I do believe a lot of remote health is going to become more and more significant. We've already seen a big boost in what people are willing to do telepathically and um, through telemedicine. And um, I think that I, uh, the consumer is much more savvy about using information that way, but I think individuals want the information. So you're not up against that hurdle at all. 
Yeah, thank you. Cynthia, this is Vu Pham based in Billings, Montana. Um, you know, uh, entrepreneurship and the, and the concept of range has come up a lot and kind of tied together. And can you talk about the importance of range in entrepreneurship and, and what aspects of range um, and how do you cultivate it? Well, I would say that a lot of us like to think about the things that we're good at and that becomes kind of our niche area of expertise. So when we wanna broaden, and I think that's what you talk about as far as range, broadening our expertise, I think the best way to do that is through education, learning to do some things that we may not have done before or had as an experience to do. And I, I think a lot of that can come through our own personal interests. Uh, golfing is a new sport for me. I did not golf before, but I like tennis. Uh, I take an art class once a month with other uh, amateur artists. I try to learn something new in the science area every week. And I think it just takes your, some of it is your own curiosity. I think some of it is uh, using it using your time to explore some areas that you may not have spent time in, but have some curiosity about. I mean, I would ask you, what do you do today that expands your range as an entrepreneur? What are the things that you do right now? If you're asking me, I think it's uh, just uh, curiosity driven. I mean, I think today's meeting in its own right. Um, and then also just constantly looking around the, the, with a sense of curiosity to, to see the possibility of things. Well, I think that's a great answer. I think curiosity is what sets leadership apart, that they're not afraid to be curious about things. I, I think the, the other thing that's really important for, for range is, is being willing to invest in yourself. We all think about spending a lot of time in other investments that we have, whether it's uh, real estate or the stock market, but the most important investment you really ever make is in yourself. And whether that's through uh, health and fitness, a nutrition, but one of the things that was very important to me early on in my career was to invest in uh, myself by going to events where I would meet the people that I thought would be the most interesting for me to know. Not always just know them for business, but that they would be events where I could actually learn and benefit from the caliber of the people that were there, the way they think, not just what they did for a living. So in the early 90s, I decided that the most important event that I could attend being in the financial world was to go to Davos for the World Economic Forum. And uh, even at that time, it was $20,000 a year to be a member of the World Economic Forum, which was not a small amount of money. And, but I saw that that was one of the best investments that I could make. And for 10 years was a member of the World Economic Forum, attended the event in Davos and attended other events around the world that they hosted. But that substantial investment was, has paid back multiple times in friendships, in ideas, in new opportunities. And it was a very substantial positive for me. And uh, I think that sometimes people are hesitant to pay to go to a conference or pay to go to a symposium or don't wanna spend the money on themselves the way they would spend money on their education or an MBA. But I think that it's really an important thing today to be willing to invest in yourself. And that might mean, as I said, it might mean golf lessons, it might mean a cooking class, it might be doing something else that's a little different from your own everyday wonder wonderful life, but that you have a chance to savor some things and learn some new things. Um, 
one of the best investments uh, I was asked for a birthday present, what I would like as a birthday present from my mother and sister. And I said, actually, what I would like is a membership to the Asia Society. And I think the individual membership was $75. But I actually attended the Asia Society meetings and went to events that they sponsored. And it was very worthwhile for me. So I think sometimes even having a chance to join some events and memberships are also ways that you change your range of thinking. Um, travel to me is one of the other unique opportunities to change your range of thinking to how a place actually looks. And that means you might even enjoy going some places in Montana that you have not been uh, if you're here. Um, I know even people that I know in Wolf Creek, I've taken them in to see things in Helena they had never seen before. So I think that we should all be, we should all put a little bit of our Lewis and Clark hat on and be explorers. It's much more interesting than staying cemented in one place or with one, one attitude. And um, I think that the Montana uh, organizations, the Montana Biotech, the Early Stage Montana, the Historical Society, uh, Archie Bray. There's so many ways to enjoy things in Montana that expand the way we think and live. I get to live in Montana because I choose it. I didn't have to be here. I'm uh, very fortunate. I was born in Coronado, California. My dad was the Naval Intelligence. I, he, one of the things he always said is before you have any bills or boyfriends, go to a city you like. So I was fortunate to work in San Diego when the biotech industry was just starting. I lived in New York City, had an extraordinary time living on Fifth Avenue and enjoying some of the best parts of New York. I have also lived in Watergate South and spent eight years living in Washington, DC and learning how Washington works. I have had an apartment in Paris. I've done the things that were interesting to me to explore some of the opportunities that, that I felt were important for my own personal growth, to learn something new about another place, and but more importantly, to learn more about the people that I would meet. Cynthia, uh, Steve Meyer from Austin, Texas. So I'm reaching out here a little bit. Uh, I found it very fascinating that your humble beginnings started in the service industry. And it's kind of interesting as a longtime mentor and advisor to technology startups, one of the common threads I find in some of the more successful early stage startups are that they've had backgrounds that either come from service industry, restaurant, food service, et cetera, from that standpoint, and that they've also been a part of teams. You know, it seems like those two components build really good teams and it builds that that mentality and that understanding of what service really means, which is very important in the entrepreneurial community, especially as we build entire societies and entire industries around service as a, or software as a service, excuse me. And I was just wondering what your, you know, what your experience has been in, in working with, the, you know, your staff, your, uh, the entrepreneurs that you've mentored and various things from that standpoint. I, I haven't put any real numbers to paper, although I have been tracking it a little bit, but I'm just kind of curious what your impressions have been along those particular lines as well. Well, Steve, I love that question because I am a very big proponent for service and learning how to deal with people in a service orientation because so many businesses, as, much, as unique as we might think they are, what it really comes down to is even in the restaurant business, uh, Tim and Nina Zagat, who had the, the good fortune of putting together the Zagat guides for many years, they will tell you that people go back to a restaurant more often because of the service that they get than the food. So I, I agree with you that service is one of the key elements. And I think um, it's one of the things that I was fortunate to learn. While I was a broker and working for Kidder Peabody, which became GE, I was very service oriented towards my clients. And I was asked to handle all the 144 business, all the insider stock trading that's legal for insiders and founders of companies. And at the time, Kidder Peabody had a rule that 
each stockbroker would only be allowed one FedEx envelope a year that we were supposed to rely on regular mail for conducting business. And when you are managing large amounts of money and securities, I knew that that was not going to be a successful way to give service to clients. So I thoughtfully went back to the manager and put my American Express card down and said, I'm going to need American Express uh, to pay for my FedExes that I'm going to need every day. I can't work with a, a firm that only wants me to have one FedEx a year. So I undertook the, the responsibility to pay for those FedExes and still have a FedEx account. But the whole key to that business, Steve, was service. So, um, and of course I was allowed to do it because it didn't come out of the office budget. It was my own personal budget, but it paid me back in multiples because I was able to deliver on what I said I could do in overnight business. And I'm a very big believer that service is the key. And I think many of us know that the places that we like to go uh, for, whether it's a haircut or whether it's going to a, a, a certain location is all based on service. I know, um, again, to talk about the excellence of Ethan Allen, they have white glove delivery service to their customers. And they found that that's in a very significant attribute that puts them above and beyond. I will also tell you a funny story in my, one of my uh, days at Kidder Peabody, uh, there was a client I really wanted to get. And I really had worked hard to try to convince him to have lunch with me, but he had continued to say he was too busy. But finally, one day through persistence, he said, I can have lunch with you on Thursday, but I only have one hour for lunch. So I confirmed that we were going to have lunch. I hired a limousine in San Diego to pick me up and then take me to his office so that I didn't have to spend time driving my car or picking him up or finding parking. And when he looked at his window and saw there was a limousine in the, in the driveway waiting to take him to lunch with me, it changed the whole perspective that he had. So he ended up spending several hours at lunch, but it wasn't to just pull a stunt. It was to really honor something that he said that he only had one hour available. What, what also was funny that day is that I met several other business people having lunch in the restaurant that were impressed that saw me taking somebody to lunch. So I'm a very big believer that if you want to do something exceptional, be interested in what other people's needs are. Um, and service, I can't say enough about it. I will tell you, I've been very complimentary to recently to a banker and got a phone call from the bank and said, are you related to this banker? And I said, no, I'm not, but they just were so exceptional in their service. But the bank, I guess, is rewarding more people for their service. And they have to make sure that you're not a relative in order to reward them for their service. So maybe sometimes there's even some suspicion about good service. <laughs> Sorry to say, but it does happen. No, there's no doubt. Service it makes all the difference because people would rather do business with friends than be customers. And uh, you know, so it, it's it's always that was an incredible story with the limousine. Uh, I, I can share similar things as well, and it it it's amazing how the smallest things, the convenience factors, can make such an impression at times. Yes, absolutely, and it it's interesting too, Steve. I had ordered uh, from Costco some new snow tires and had those put on. And now I've ordered regular tires from Costco, but I got a call from them yesterday that said they noticed that the tires that had come in were, were older than one year old, even though they're new tires, they were older than one year. And they said, we really don't want you to keep your appointment for Friday. We need to get two new tires. And it's not inconvenient not to not to go on Friday, but I was really impressed that they took the time to tell me 
they looked at their own inventory and saw that those tires were not going to be within their standards and that they would not uh, they were going to order two more tires. So you can't, you don't forget service. You might forget a product, but you really don't forget service. So I, I think that that is one of the most important things in business today. It's also important when you tell people you're going to call them back or you're going to send them something and to follow up with those things. So those are also part of the service aspect. I think being on time, I've actually talked to investors that were in Montana that said that uh, they would they they had turned down some opportunities because people weren't prepared or they were not uh, they were not on time. Even some of the things that we might take for granted or subtle, people take very seriously today because they're looking for those keys to see: Are you paying attention? Are you are you uh, being mindful of other people's uh, time as well? So even some of those small things, there are things that seem small, I think are becoming much more important in a competitive marketplace. Hi, uh, this is Ann Peterson. I'm in Bozeman. Um, I love this concept of, of service. I kind of started in service as well and uh, have been focused. And, and currently I hope I help early stage tech companies in Montana and sort of hopefully a little bit of a feeder for Jenny um, and her uh, thing. But I would love to hear um, uh, your perspective. When you were starting, bringing in that service, um, I, we talk a lot about when we're coaching people about just the service leadership. Um, focusing on the customer. And I don't mean that so, I, I, I totally believe in it, customer discovery, all of this, but that concept of, of serving their outcomes, focusing on how, how you can make their lives better. And was that something um, when you were starting uh, your business back in 1995, uh, how did you approach that? How did you approach some of, you know, how are you going to help the marketplace or the people? Um, and then how did you Build your team, your early stage team. We talk, you talk about kind of, we talked about range and stretching because founders have to wear many hats, but obviously you want to pull in people that can help support your, your early stage idea. I'd love to hear kind of some of the thoughts you had about that. Well, Anne, I, I like that because I truly believe that you have to build teams around you when you read what the definition of an entrepreneur is, it will talk about someone that can take risk. But entrepreneurs are more than that. Entrepreneurs are the people that talk other people into taking risks with them. So I agree. There's only one word that I do not like to use, and I would encourage you all to replace a word that we use too, too frequently, which is help. I don't like to say I want to help a company. Help is something you do for needy uh, people that may need more assistance or something in a foundation. I like to use the word, I want to work with you. I think work has a much stronger backbone to it and it gives the companies or the individuals that we're with a much stronger sense of a, achievement if we're going to work with them versus help them. So I always try to use the word work more than help. And I've encouraged other people who have found that it's more beneficial for them as well. What I would say is building teams it always has, has the biggest challenges, but it's the most important. Many of the companies that I advise and work with uh, their challenges are not technology. Their challenges are working with people and learning how to assimilate differences in, in style. And I think part of it is learning a lot more about the people we work with and the acceptance of their style. Uh, Jenny mentioned that I work with a multinational company in India in Hyderabad that has five engineers. And when we've had meetings in places like Topeka, Kansas, one of the first things that happened was that 
uh, nine of these engineers that had flown from Hyderabad to meet for this very substantial meeting, they were all vegetarians, but they didn't realize that they're going to places where there's a lot of barbecue and they were gonna be pretty hungry at lunchtime because there wasn't gonna be much for them to have. So some of it is also understanding culturally what people want and what works for them. So very rapidly, we had to assemble some farm to table restaurants and places that they could go so that they would have a chance to have lunch and dinner, not just rely on barbecue beef sandwiches. The other thing that, that we have to learn culturally is with this group from Hyderabad, I said, we have a 7.30 a.m. meeting, we need to bring coffee and donuts. And it was something unique for them because that's not what they would do in Hyderabad to a meeting. So I think understanding culturally, some of the things that are important to our group, whether it's uh, how they celebrate their holidays, how they celebrate time, um, how they celebrate things with their families, all of those things are important. So. I think you have to build teams with awareness of their cultural needs, not just their educational background, what they've accomplished. Um, I think it's always been interesting when I've interviewed people, I think they think that I'm gonna ask them about their resume, but I'm really more interested, I'll ask them, what book are you reading? And <laughs> they're a little startled by that. They think that I'm gonna ask them about school or their education or their current job, but I built my teams based on people that I think were energetic, that were idea oriented and pretty much uh, motivated uh, to set some goals for themselves. Uh, one of the very first people that I hired to work with me on HealthQuest was a young woman from uh, Texas, from Austin, Texas, and she was originally from Pineville, Louisiana, and she had received her uh, master's degree, but she really wanted to work in New York City, and we worked, we started the business in my living room on Fifth Avenue and eventually moved to an office, but it was really interesting working with someone that had been come right out of school and the things that we learned from each other working. And uh, within three years, she was able to uh, accelerate what she learned. Uh, we worked a lot on the things that were important to her as far as she still had some student debt. And rather than just giving her a bonus or a raise, there were times that that bonus or raise went towards I would pay directly on her student debt. So I looked at what individually would motivate her too. I think that's an important thing for finding employees, finding partners, finding directors. What motivates them individually versus what is only our own motivation? I've had businesses that people had to work for equity and they didn't work for cash. And that's a very different type of motivation as well. So I think you have to know a lot about what motivates people individually. Great, thank you very much, really helpful. I'll jump in with a bit of a niche question. Um, great to see you again, Cynthia, thanks for your time today. I'm currently trying to figure out what, who I want on my board and wondering with all of your experience, what have you seen be the characteristics of the most um, or the makeup of the most effective boards that you've seen? Well, I think about that question a lot because it is the biggest challenge CEOs that I know face. Many of them uh, started out with boards that they had different expectations around. And I think sometimes it's expectations that are not in alignment rather than people's capabilities. I think the other thing is that boards of directors are not Supreme Court justices. They're not there for a lifetime. I think the people that come into a board, are they going to be useful to the goals the company, the leadership has right now and looking out two years, three years? So my, my suggestion is to 
work with people that you know the best. I would also say uh, selecting a board is also important that the board members themselves work can work comfortably together, have respect for each other and have some diversity of ideas, mm. but that the board gets along. Uh, most of the problems and challenges that I've seen and, and personally had to endure have to come with a board or one person in a board that is disruptive to all of the plans of the, of the company or the board because they want to move forward. So I would say that getting to know people on the board is important before you select them, finding out what are their goals. I also think finding people that are generally active and busy uh, as board members. And, and I don't think that we do enough due diligence. Um, we might check people that are employees, we check their background, but I think it's important uh, when you start looking for board members, if you're going to go outside of a range of people that you yourself know, to really drill down and find out their achievements, their accomplishments, their capabilities, their network. And um, sometimes it's, it's one of the biggest challenges for uh, a company is to identify directors that are even come to meetings prepared. Yeah. Um, that's, I've heard so many CEOs be so disappointed that some of their de directors never even read the information that was sent out ahead of time. And um, I think when you, when you also select directors and work with directors, you need to be a proactive listener about what's their goal or where can they be the most useful to the company as far as ideas and mm -hmm. introductions. And a lot of early stage companies obviously need to raise money. So will those directors be useful to raising money? Mm -hmm. Do they have a network? Have they ever invested in, in startup companies or early stage companies? Or do they see it as more of a, uh, an opportunity for themselves. So I think you have to really, you really have to spend some time vetting through boards and you don't need a big board. Mm -hmm. I think though um, an important part for companies to remember is that investors invest in people first. I know we all get excited about a technology or a service, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to the people and they're gonna look when you send a piece of information or a PowerPoint or you're doing a video of show off the people in the company, that's what makes it exciting. And then they'll look at the technology and then they'll look at the financial page. How are you going to move this technology or service forward? But don't go short on the bios of the people that you've brought in, you've attracted to your business. It's really important. Um, one of the things that was really funny that happened to me is that I thought that, you know, I should knew, learn a little bit more about the international world and the future of security in the world because I spent some time in Washington working with the former head of the CIA, former head of the FBI in a company called Executive Action. And they were doing global problem solving and I was working with them because of the interest I had from some biotech companies in bioterrorism. And so one of the things that I thought would be interesting was to go to a, an event in Rome that the Financial Times was sponsoring on the future of European security. So I fly to Rome and first of all, there's no driver to pick me up and uh, they won't page anybody in the airport because they're afraid of security, which was kind of an interesting moment to arrive in, in Italy and know that <laughs> they don't page people in the airport. And when I got to the conference, I, I noticed that there were a lot of people noticing me coming into this conference. And um, I was there to learn about what they were talking about as far as the future of NATO, et cetera. And finally, someone walked up to me, a man walked up to me and said, we're really all curious about who you are. And I introduced myself and he said, well, we, we're we all arms dealers. <laughs> and well, <laughs> it wasn't exactly what I was planning on, 
But I didn't realize that a headline of the future of European security and a conference by the Financial Times was going to be all arms dealers. So I think we all have to be open and we have to be curious about things and uh, be willing to, to try something new and maybe give a little bit of humor to ourselves in the way we saw some perspectives of something. Thank you. Probably have time for one more question. Who's it gonna be? <laughs> May I ask a question? Hi, yeah. this is Jen Simmons. I'm friends with Cynthia. I've known her for a long time and she's been a great contact and mentor and friend. So um, my question is, you talk about self-care and taking care of yourself. Um, do you have any suggestions for people who are entrepreneur entrepreneurial minded is there anything special you would suggest that they incorporate into their self-care so that they're taking care of themselves, but also what they're doing helps fuel more of their entrepreneurialism? Thank you, Jen. Burnout. It's so nice to hear your voice. And uh, you're just been a wonderful friend and entrepreneur and no, I remember the days that you and I in New York would meet for a manicure. We didn't go to lunch. We just meet for a manicure and chat about companies and ideas for 40 minutes and then run out. So I, I think one of the most important things and the data shows it is being able to spend part of your day outdoors. And of course, in Montana, we love that. We savor it. We, we do that often. But I think even walking through Central Park for an hour a day or half an hour a day, I think spending some time in nature every day is a really important part for humans. We have a chance to, to breathe the fresh air and, and see what's around us and get some sunshine or enjoy the, the birds that are migrating or the deer in the yard in Montana. But I do think spending some time outdoors every day is really important for human health, not just all the other good things. And I, I think uh, I heard someone say the other day that they, they really were, it was really important for them to get enough sleep. And I think that's another important thing that sometimes entrepreneurs miss out on. We're multitasking, we're doing many, many things, but we need to take some time to make sure that we do have some peacefulness, restfulness in our lives too. All of the, I think all of those things are important. Okay, great, thank you. Well, I would ask everyone to unmute themselves and let's <laughs> give it Cynthia a round of applause and a warm thank you for all of the fantastic advice and wisdom that she shared with us today. So, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so much. Cynthia. Thank you. <laughs> and Cynthia, hey, Jennifer, this is Liz. Cynthia, can, can you repeat your contact information? Sure, I'd be happy to. My, my phone number, my mobile number is 917-297-3674. You can text me or call. And my email is Cynthia, my first name, C-Y-N-T-H-I-A, healthquest at yahoo.com. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, that was great. I, uh, I took away so many valuable things. I've got, you know, build your brand, celebrate your wins, try something mm -hmm. new. You know, focus on diversity of ideas and be an explorer. And so I think those are all important things for us to think about as we, uh, we go out and grow our ventures or, you know, work on our, our day to day impact. So thank you so much for sharing all of that uh, wonderful advice and for being so generous with your contact information and your willingness to, uh, to support entrepreneurs here in Montana. It's, uh, it's fascinating to hear your journey from, uh, from Watergate to Wall Street to Wolf Creek, Montana. Uh -huh. <laughs> to 
arms dealing. You. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> arms dealing. <laughs> yeah, we're all gonna be reaching out for more more tips on arms dealing. Yeah, <laughs> more there. Part of the Yeah, part of the range. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I'll let you all get back to your days. Um, I do have a few announcements. Next month, we'll be back here uh, with some folks from the Idaho National Lab, as well as TechLink to talk about licensing opportunities to uh, work with them to develop technology and or to license some of their technologies to build a business around. So excited to bring them together uh, next month. And then it is springtime in Montana. So that means that there is a buzz of activity and tons of opportunities to, uh, to meet folks and get involved in your local community. So this week is the John Rafato Startup Plan Competition tomorrow at the University of Montana. Highly recommended. It. It's so fun to see the startups that are coming out of the universities. And then in two weeks, the, the Montana State University will be having their own 50K Venture Challenge. So um, anyway, lots going on. And I hope to, uh, to see you in, uh, in person one of these days. But if not, we'll, we'll hopefully see you back here in May. And once again, thank you, thank you, Cynthia. It was such a pleasure. <laughs> thank you all. Okay. All right. Enjoy the day. Happy Easter. Bye. Bye.